Um, so I'm joined today by uh, Glenn Stanfield and Paul Woodgates. Uh, the question is, uh, obviously, has uh, the Labour and Jeremy Corbyn's promise been a black swan, an event that has turned all our assumptions on its head? And where might a future settlement lie? What do, does higher education need to hold on to absolutely to be successful in the future? very much. Now, uh, Glenn Stanfield, Eversheds, you've worked on many big deals. Uh, you probably have one of the widest views. You've advised the department uh, on various bits of legislation. Uh, let's hear your take on the current situation and the impacts of this debate. Great. Thank, and thank you very much, Neil. Um, so I'm going to stick with your black swan, if I may. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the certainties, uncertainties, and I'm going to start with the known unknowns. So I think there are a lot of known unknowns on the table. So I think if you, if you were to think about it from a black swan point of view, these are things that we should, in theory, be able to plan for. And I'm going to start with the, the two obvious ones, which are the OFS, Office for Students, and the less well-known one, which is UKRI. And I'm going to focus a little bit, actually, on UKRI first, because obviously for the sort of top third of the higher education sector in the UK, UKRI, which will be one of the biggest funding bodies that the UK has ever formed, is going to have a major impact. Uh, and as a firm, we've actually been involved in the formation of that. And we can see that people are starting to change in those organizations. So the seven research councils coming together, a lot of the top management uh, of those research councils are starting to leave. And therefore, you're having brand new management team put into place. It's going to be very interesting indeed to see what the impact of UKRI is going to be as a thunder of the sector number one. Number two is in terms of the OFS. We know there are some new rules coming out in university, title degree awarding powers and all the other powers that are going to invest in the OFS. We haven't seen those, but uh, we are told they're coming out uh, in the next six to eight weeks. I think they could have a very significant impact on the sector, both in terms of those currently in the sector and those who are seeking to actually join the sector as well, because we certainly have a number of clients who are very keen to actually join the sector if they can, and are now waiting to see what these new rules look like. I think the other element of uncertainty we should think about is the two acts that the last government passed just before it uh, left office, which were the Higher Education Research Act, under which bodies like OFS are formed, and the Technical and Further Education Act. Um, neither have been brought into force in full, uh, and the question is, will they be brought into force in full? And I think that is a very open question. It's an open question of when as well. I mean, the pressure on parliamentary time is huge at the moment. If you were to, to try to sort of uh, move a private act to Parliament, some people on the table are involved in that, the University of London bill, for example, you will know how difficult it is to find parliamentary time to, to even get a, a small bill like that, a non-controversial uh, bill uh, moving through Parliament. And I, I've mentioned a little bit on the, the, the technical and further education act. You can say, well, that's got nothing much to do with higher education, but I think it does because there's a real sting in the tail um, for, for the higher education sector in it, which is that for the first time the governors of further education colleges are going to be exposed to personal claims. It's actually set out in the, in the, in the law there. And it's effectively, uh, they'd be treated as if they're a director of an insolvent company if a further education college were to fail. And that therefore means that if that type of rule were to apply to a governor of an FE college, something very similar is going to apply to governors of higher education. Uh, and, and so the question is, are we going to find it more difficult to find people to serve on the governing bodies of, of higher and for education colleges in this uh, brave new world. I couldn't sort of uh, let this um, slot pass without mentioning the, the, the B word, Brexit. Um, we've got instructions from 12 British universities at the moment who are very seriously looking to set up campuses in the European Union. They're looking to do that for a, a wide range of reasons. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, they want to hold on to their uh, EU research funding. Sometimes they actually want to make sure that they bring some of their students outside of the UK visa rules and bring them within the Schengen area because if you set up in the Schengen area there's obviously very different rules that apply there and you can offer a British degree under those uh, Schengen rules and also applies to staff as well. So the ability to bring staff and students into the EU to offer a British award I think is, uh, is very interesting indeed. And clearly there's one or two British universities that already have campuses in the European Union and therefore need to do something about it. I think it will also sort of throw British universities to think about whether they should be looking to expand outside of the European Union. Of course, before the EU was formed, Britain used to do most of its higher education, at the international point of view, well outside of the European Union. 
the European Union wasn't seen as an important area for British higher education. The question, will British universities again seek to look more to the Asian markets, to the Gulf, and those sort of areas? Um, we should also, I guess, uh, think briefly about the demographic trends. We know that British student numbers are, are in decline, um, and um, every British university wants to move up some league table. So for every British university moving up the league table, another one has to move down. Uh, and the question is how those demographic trends are going to play out against that, and also linked to that learning models. We've seen the University of Buckingham, two-year degree program. We've seen the sort of move towards online learning, to blended learning, maybe to studying online for one year, and then having a campus-based education with a couple of models, very much an American model. Are, are we going to see more of that, and what impact is that going to have? Neil has talked about the significant pressure on fees, on student uh, fees, and the ability to draw down student funding, and that obviously begs the question about the European Union students who are also currently drawing down funding. But I think there's, there's also pressure on staff pay, isn't there? And, and I think we have seen a lot of uh, vice chancellors drawn from the private sector in the last few years. Uh, I think it's a, a very brave person who would actually seek to move from the private sector to the public sector in a vice chancellor type role at the moment. Because if you think about it from a freedom of information point of view, or the sort of uh, public inspection and scrutiny, and scrutiny that you are subject to, uh, I think it's very difficult indeed. It may impact on the ability to move uh, some people in the private sector at a lower level than vice chancellor as well. Uh, our view is that you may see some mergers in higher education that you saw a few years ago. It would probably take two or three years for that to work through the system because the reserves that most British universities have got are probably two or three years. So they can carry on a bit like a super tanker for some time. But you've only got to look at what happened in Wales, where 13 universities came down to eight. You've also got to look at what's going on in the further education sector, the area-based reviews, and how you've seen one-third of further education colleges being merged. And of course, there is no such thing as a merger. A merger is a very nice word, it's a polite word, but actually the reality is that one will take over the other. And that's actually what we are seeing, and so therefore we think within two to three years we will see a significant number of mergers uh, in the uh, British context, and probably more in, uh, more from an England point of view than, than, than elsewhere. Um, I think we should also look at, at the, the growth of these FEHE groups. Uh, the Department of Education is currently paying the cost of five trials, where you've got a higher education institution looking to sort of take over and merge with a further education institution. So you've got South Bank and Lambeth, Central Lancashire, Preston's College, Bolton, Bolton College, Southampton, Solent. Uh, and the idea that we're looking at is an all-through education system. So the question is, what impact is that going to have on the sector as a whole? Um, linked to that, you've got things like the sort of institutes of technology, where uh, bids have to be put in by the end of this month, uh, and there's a number of HEs involved in those as well. So it's, a, it's an attempt to look at a source of funding that maybe uh, you otherwise uh, wouldn't look at. I don't think, as a Welshman, I can sort of let it pass that actually you've got four devolved administrations in the UK. And a lot of our cross-border work these days is actually around playing with English and Welsh rules or the English and Scottish rules or the Northern Irish rules. And obviously you've got very different governments in each of the devolved administrations all looking to do very different things. Um, so Queen's University of Belfast has got a very successful English campus, for example, and that English campus is able to tap into student loan company funding. So why couldn't you do something similar by, by looking to play with those rules? Um, when David Willits was the uh, university's minister, he talked about the wall of cash from the U.S. private equity market. It is there. It's there. I get a call a week probably from a U.S. private equity who are looking to invest their money in the U.K. in some way, shape or form. And they will, there's no doubt this government will be looking at that and, and how it can use that money to sort of offset taxpayers' funding. Um, we've got a number of clients of, who are looking to enter the market waiting for these new rules and, and the question is how are they going to do that? Are they going to do a college of law model? Are they, are they going to take over an existing institution? Are they going to take a, a school, a business school, for example, it's possible to demerge a business school and actually create a new entity uh, from that? Or are they going to set up something from scratch? Are they going to take over for an education college which may be able to apply for degree awarding powers in its own right? So you're going to see the market, I think, is, is going to uh, shift. Uh, and the last uh, factor I, I see driving the market is this three billion pounds of levy funding. First question I pose is actually, is it three billion pounds of levy funding? Because 
the big four accountancy firms are running around in a very quiet way and offering advice to commercial entities as to how they can lower the amount of levy funding they're going to pay. It's a tax planning route, isn't it? So the government assumes three billion without any tax planning at all. My guess is it will be much less than that when the levy starts flowing through. And the question is how, from a higher education point of view, uh, is that going to work through? So I think, coming back to the, to, the, to the black swan, there's a lot of known unknowns, and I've tried to pinpoint some of those. But obviously what I don't know is the unknown unknowns. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn.